The House will come to order. Members are advised to please take their conversations off the floor. The House will be in order. The House will be in order. Gentlemen, from Thank California. you very much, Madam Speaker. As I said, with this August second date rapidly approaching, uh, we know that uh, we are faced with the potential of running out of money. We also know that under that kind of scenario, there are no winners and there are no losers. We have a profound responsibility to resolve the crisis at hand and avert the economic catastrophe that will come if we do not join together and find a way to raise the debt ceiling. But, Madam Speaker, this looming crisis is not the fundamental problem. We're facing this crisis because of a much larger, much longer-term problem. The federal government spends more than it has. If you think about it, Madam Speaker, we don't have a debt ceiling problem. What we have is a debt problem. The former cannot be resolved without addressing the latter. You can't address the debt ceiling issue unless you address the debt issue that is before us. That's precisely what today's process and the amendment that we are putting to the measure that we debated all day yesterday is all about. And the rule before us is moving us toward addressing the root cause of the problem. We're adding another layer of accountability, something that Democrats and Republicans alike regularly talk about. Accountability is being added to the plan that Speaker Boehner is moving forward. With the amendment that we're going to consider uh, that this rule will make an order, the House will proceed with the critical business at hand. We will pass a bold and credible plan to rein in our debt and responsibly avert the crisis that looms just a few days from now. It's extremely unfortunate that this process has become so lengthy and partisan. I think everyone feels very saddened at the fact that it's become such a lengthy and very, very partisan process. But, Madam Speaker, time is running out. Today we have the opportunity to do our work and with passage of this measure, we will be moving the process forward to help avert the crisis that we potentially face on August 2nd. When we pass this out, we will send the measure to the Senate. And as we all know, this is the only proposal, this is the only proposal that when we pass it today, that will have passed either House of Congress. We need to have the support to do that. I hope very much that while many of my colleagues may not be supportive of all the provisions in the Boehner plan or on the other side of the aisle, I hope very much that to move the process forward so that we can ensure that our constituents get their Social Security checks on August 3rd, since we all know the President in his July 12th speech said that if we don't increase the debt ceiling by August 2nd, he couldn't guarantee that Social Security checks would go out. So to keep the process moving, to ensure that we get those checks out and address the other very, very important priorities that we need to have funding for, that we can pass this in a bipartisan way so that we can get to the Senate, work out our differences as expeditiously as possible, and come back with what clearly has to be a bipartisan compromise to ensure that we are able to decrease spending, getting to the root cause of the problem, and at the same time do what we all know has to be done, and that is increase the debt ceiling. With that, Madam Speaker, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from California reserves the balance of his time. The gentlelady from New York. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank my good friend, the gentleman from California, Chair of the Rules Committee, for yielding me the customary 30 minutes, and I yield myself such time as I may consume, ask unanimous consent to revise and extend. Objection. The gentlelady is recognized. Thank you. Madam Speaker, today we face a self-inflicted crisis, and the majority's proposed solution is no solution at all. The debt ceiling was created, ironically, to avoid forcing Congress to approve every new issue of debt. Madam Speaker, the House is not in order. 
Gentlelady is correct. The House will come to order. The House will come to order. Members are asked to please take their conversations off the floor. Gentlelady from New York. The debt ceiling was recently, uh, originally introduced to pay for World War I and was designed to be a formality that would help our country and economy operate smoothly and without interruption. And all these years later, having done that, the debt ceiling now appears to have outlived its usefulness. In fact, I believe that we should abolish the debt limit altogether and never face a crisis like this again of whether we will be a responsible country that pays our bills. Only one other country has the debt limit, and that is Denmark. I think we can, uh, we can really need to look at this as anachronism from 1917. Regardless, throughout the light, uh, life of the debt ceiling, raising the ceiling has never been questioned. Since 1960, the debt ceiling has been raised 78 times. And throughout this time, there has been no quid pro quo demanded to raise the debt ceiling, no ransom demanded in exchange for raising our debt ceiling and preventing default. That is until today. Bringing our nation to the brink of collapse has been a conscious decision of the majority party. Placing ideology before country, they are demanding controversial and unacceptable cuts or else they are willing to let our nation default. We have been warned by the United States Senate, the President of the United States, that the proposed legislation will not be passed into law. They have said it repeatedly. They have said it clearly. Yet the majority continues to believe this bill can actually avert the danger of default. They're playing a dangerous game of chicken, asking the nation to give in to their demands if we want the American economy to live to see another day. I simply cannot agree to the extreme demands being put forth by the majority today. After pulling yesterday's legislation from the floor, the majority has introduced a piece of legislation that demands the impossible. Today's bill doesn't just require a vote on a constitutional amendment. It demands that before the six months when we have to uh, face default again, that we vote on a constitutional amendment and that it be approved by both chambers of Congress this fall. If the amendment doesn't pass, then we not only face the prospect of default again six months from now, but we have even fewer options to avoid default. If previous proposals are any guide, the constitutional amendment would place the burden of debt reduction squarely upon the middle class. Threatening Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, and members of Congress would be given the Sophie's choice. Do we vote against this amendment and protect Medicare, or do we vote for the amendment to avoid economic default? This is totally unnecessary. In effect, this legislation releases one hostage and takes another. Six months from now, we would be forced to choose between a constitutional amendment and putting the nation back on the brink of default. I refuse to trade hostages with majority and prolong this crisis for another six months. I urge my colleagues to put the country before any ideology and come together to solve an urgent and serious crisis that we are facing today. It's our duty to put the welfare of the country before all else. That is why we were elected by the people who expect us to do just that. And that is what we swear to do. It is time we answer the call. I urge my colleagues to vote no on today's bill and urgently, urgently get back to serving the American people. Uh, we spent far too much time on this useless bill. I reserve the balance of my time. The gentlelady from New York reserves the balance of her time. The gentleman from California. Madam Speaker, I, I yield myself 15 seconds to say to my good friend that I'd like to totally associate myself with her remarks at the end in which she said that it is absolutely essential for us to work together in a bipartisan way to resolve this issue. But I know this will come as a surprise when she began her remarks and said that we on our side are working overtime, making a conscious decision to bring our nation to the verge of collapse, that that is a slight mischaracterization of uh, exactly where we are. And with that, Madam Speaker, I'd like to yield uh, two minutes, two minutes to my uh, good friend from Spring Hill, a uh, hardworking and uh, not too well-rested member of the Rules Committee, uh, Mr. Nugent. Gentleman from Florida is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I want to thank the distinguished chair of the Rules Committee, Mr. Dreyer, for allowing me to speak. 
I'll be perfectly honest with you, there's a lot about this rule that I don't love. But quite frankly, we don't have much time left. We need to get something done, and we need to get something done now. This rule provides us with the tools and the mechanisms that we need to get our jobs done and bring our economy, or our country, back from the brink of default. Default is not an option. The underlying legislation, the Budget Control Act of 2011, saves us from default. Most of all, I support the Budget Control Act of 2011 because it means both chambers of Congress must pass a balanced budget amendment before the President can raise the debt ceiling once again. Do I like everything in the bill? No, I don't. Does it do what the American people and the American economy need and deserve? Yes, it does. And that's why I support both the rule and the underlying legislation. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman from Florida yields back his time. Gentlelady from New York. Madam Speaker, I'm pleased to yield one and a half minutes to the gentleman from Michigan, the ranking member on Ways and Means, Mr. Levin. Gentleman from Michigan is recognized for one and a half minutes. Okay. The gentleman is recognized. The gentleman from California has been talking about moving the process forward. It does not move the process forward to pass a bill that's dead before arrival in the Senate. It doesn't move the process forward to pass a bill that is even more partisan than the one yesterday. You know, the country has to be wondering, we're one day closer to default and indeed one step backwards. The Republicans are trying to squeeze out a majority here. And what they're doing is inserting a provision that requires a two-thirds vote in the Senate and the House. Now that's completely a non-starter. The American public is looking for a solution, not a stalemate. And the House Republicans have become the party of gridlock. Passing this only increases it. It's a move backwards, maybe to protect your flank, but not to protect America. I yield back. Gentleman from Michigan yields back. Gentleman from California. Friend, that I, there's a bit of a disconnect from my perspective. So, failure to act is not gridlock. Passing legislation out of the House of Representatives is, in fact, gridlock. With that, Madam Speaker, I'd like to yield a minute to my friend from Cincinnati, Mr. Shabbat. Gentleman from Ohio is recognized for one minute. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Our national debt stands at a staggering $14.3 trillion, and we currently borrow more than 40 cents on every dollar we spend. And our president and Democrats in the other body say that a balanced budget amendment is, quote, dead on arrival. Fifteen years ago, the balanced budget amendment passed the House with a bipartisan vote only to lose by one vote, one vote in the Senate. A constitutional amendment is the only way to ensure that future Congresses live within their means and end the spending binge. Our colleague, Congressman McClintock, might have summed it up best in a Washington Times op-ed earlier this week. He said, imagine a family that earns $50,000 a year but is spending more than $88,000 a year and has a credit card balance of $330,000 a year. That's us. We're bankrupt and Washington is broken. Why are Senate Democrats and the President so afraid of making a commitment to balance our budget? Stop the spending. No more empty promises. No more excuses. I yield back. Gentlelady from New York. Madam Speaker, I'm pleased to yield two minutes to the gentleman from Texas, a member of the Committee on Ways and Means, Mr. Doggett. The gentleman from you. Texas is recognized for two minutes. You know, yesterday when the Speaker failed to secure the votes for his misbegotten deal, I thought all these Republicans would have out here today would would be to get underway with a professional physical therapist to help heal the twisted arms. 
the sprains, perhaps even a dislocation, as all that pressure was applied by the speaker to get those final votes. You know, a therapist to kind of fit the slings and apply the splints. But no, the professional obstructionists among the Republicans have yielded for far less than a deep muscle massage. All they need is a meaningless vote on amendment that is designed to fail, that they know will never rewrite the United States Constitution the way they would like to rewrite it, to enshrine a little Republican dogma into the supreme law of the land. I'll admit that through the years, the ballot's budget amendment has gained more interest on my part. It became much more appealing as I saw years of Republicans entering wars without paying for them, insisting upon the mythology. No, indeed, it's really a political theology of Republicans that you can cut taxes, raise spending, and everything will work out okay. Their approach, even though their experts told them these tax, pay, these tax cuts would drive us into deficit, they insisted on the political alchemy that they could take tax cuts and turn them in to surpluses just as if they could turn hay into gold. If there were one vote I could take to do something about the George W. Bush administration dripping in red ink, I would certainly want to take it. But a constitutional amendment is not a solution. It's an excuse for not having a solution, for not grappling with the financial problems we have. And the only reason it's being brought up this weekend it's just to delay this crisis nearer and nearer to the precipice to which this Republican irresponsibility has taken us. The creditworthiness, the full faith in the credit of the United States is endangered by their refusal to adopt a balanced approach that would close some tax loopholes and reduce spending all at once. That's what we need. Instead of putting all the burden on the many, demand a little from the few at the top. Gentleman from California. Madam Speaker, uh, at this time I'd like to yield two minutes to one of our very capable and thoughtful new members of the 112th Congress, the gentleman from Drexel Hill, Pennsylvania, Mr. Meehan. The gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. As we've been talking so much, I hear so much about a balanced approach. What we really need is a balanced budget. The concern right now, as I talk to the many phone callers who are coming in is that America has taken the time to tighten their belts at home. And when you talk to business people, they've made the tough decisions. And they're looking to us now to make the tough decisions as well. And that's what I think this legislation has done. Legislation which we can look at right now and, and we can put away the arguments from each side, the Republican side and the Democratic side. This is about America right now. The people who are calling in who are watching, they are watching right now and greatly concerned because of the fact that they feel their economic security is at risk because we can't deal with the long-term implications of this budget and this debt. There is a plan. And the Republicans in this House have put together a plan. And I'm not going to get into the partisan rhetoric. Let us go around this plan. If we've got differences, let us resolve those differences effectively for the American people. Let us get to work in this House, get it to the Senate, pass it today, so we can get the good work done that will allow America to get back to work with a sense of confidence in the future of our economy, get people back to work creating jobs. Will the gentleman yield? I certainly will. I, I thank my friend for yielding, and I'd like to compliment him on his uh, very thoughtful remarks, Madam Speaker, and say that as I listen to this newly elected member of the House, uh, it's very difficult to imagine that he would consciously engage in an effort to bring our nation to the verge of collapse, because we want to solve this problem and ensure that we can have a strong and vibrant United States of America creating jobs and getting our economy growing. And I thank my friend for his thoughtful comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentlelady from New York. Madam Speaker, I am pleased to yield a minute and a half to the uh, gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Scott, a constitutional scholar. Gentleman from Vir Virginia, for uh, one and a half minutes. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, this rule provides for debate of legislation that was slapped together behind closed doors, providing for trillions of dollars in unspecified cuts. The final version was sprung on the, sprung on the House after being made public just this morning, and now we're expected to vote the whole thing up or down without amendment, in spite of the fact that 53 senators are already on record saying they'll oppose it. This legislation is in response to a manufactured so-called crisis. We can avoid default on our obligations the same way we've done it every, almost once a year over the last half century, just increase the debt ceiling. And now this final version calls for default on our obligations unless we pass a constitutional amendment mislabeled a balanced budget amendment. The so-called balanced budget, balance budget amendment reported from the Judiciary Committee does not require a balanced budget. In fact, it will make it more difficult to balance the budget and it will certainly jeopardize Social Security and Medicare. It will also include a provision that requires a three-fifths vote to increase the debt ceiling as if this week's drama isn't enough of a spectacle. This, Ms. Madam Speaker, we should end this manufactured crisis, increase the debt ceiling to avoid default, and then seriously focus on legislation that will create jobs and restore fiscal responsibility. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman from Virginia yields back the balance of his time. Madam Speaker, I'd like to reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman from California reserves. A gentlelady from New York. Madam Speaker, I'm pleased to yield two minutes to a gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Andrews. Gentleman from New Jersey for two minutes. And the gentleman is recognized for two minutes. The inevitable consequence of this bill is that when the United States wants to extend the debt ceiling to pay our bills, we will have to reduce Medicare and Social Security. That's the inevitable consequence of these balanced budget amendments. Therefore, inevitably, this bill will not see the light of day in the United States Senate. What we ought to do is get to our inevitable obligation, which is to come to an agreement that extends our debt ceiling and makes a responsible down payment on our deficit. The President of the United States this morning outlined a way to do that, and that's what we ought to be working on. He talked about commonality between the two houses and the two parties on cuts in annual programs in the area of 5, 6, 7 percent. Painful, but necessary. He talked about a fair process where a body that would act between the House and the Senate would consider all the options with respect to entitlement programs, protecting Medicare and Social Security benefits, and looking at a contribution from the wealthiest Americans, the form of revenue, would be considered and voted on. And certainly that approach would get us out of this period of uncertainty where we've not extended uh, the, the debt ceiling for the country, as was done 17 times without condition for President Reagan, seven times without condition for President George W. Bush. This is an inevitable waste of time, this bill. It's a bad idea. Let's get on to the better idea of approaching this problem fixing the problem for our country. Vote no on this underlying bill and this rule. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from California Speaker, continue to reserve continues to reserve. The gentlelady from New York. Madam Speaker, I'm pleased to yield one minute to yet another constitutional scholar, gentleman from North Carolina, member of the Judiciary Committee, Mr. Watt. Gentleman from North Carolina for one minute. Madam Speaker, I think this may be the absolute worst resolution I have seen before this House in the 19 years I've been here. It brings to a continuing debate a bill that has already been debated yesterday with an amendment, but there's only one minute left in the debate. And the change that is being made requires the passage of a, a, an amendment to the Constitution of the United States in order to ever raise the debt limit again. The effect of that is that we have one minute. We don't even have it. The majority has the one minute that's left in the debate. We have no time left in the debate on our side to debate whether we will pass an amendment to the Constitution of the United States that literally holds a gun to the head of the economy of the United States of America. We ought to be ashamed of ourselves legislating in this way. This is a terrible way to legislate 
uh, with, uh, to, to provide for a constitutional amendment. If we're going to do it, we ought to at least debate it in good faith. I yield back. Gentleman's time's expired. The gentleman from California. Uh, Madam Speaker, let me continue to reserve the balance. Of my Continues time. to reserve. The gentlelady from New York. I'm pleased to yield a minute to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Moran. Let me, oh, come right out. Oh, sorry, said gentleman from Virginia for one uh, minute. minute. Mr. Chairman, this is a self contrived bankruptcy. You know, a decade ago, the majority party inherited surpluses as far as the eye could see. And then they promptly took away the revenue that enabled us to balance our budget. They crippled this country with deep tax cuts. In fact, we have the lowest revenue that we've had at any time since before Medicare and, and basically at any time since the 1920s. And what this is going to do, and the way we re reason we oppose this, is that uh, if this was on the books, we never would have had the ability to rescue the world from the Great Depression in the 1930s. We never have, would have had the ability to win the war for democracy in the 1940s. We never would have won the race to space uh, for the free world in the 60s. We never would have been able to establish Medicare and civil rights legislation in the mid-60s. And certainly, had we stuck with this kind of approach to government, we never would have been able to create 20 million new jobs as we did in the 1990s and reduce poverty, expand the middle class, and create all those surpluses that the majority inherited and qu promptly squandered. This is not the right thing for our country, and that's why it should be defeated. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Gentleman from California. Madam Speaker, at this time I'm very privileged to yield two minutes to my very good friend from Glendale, Arizona, Mr. Franks. Gentleman from Arizona is recognized for two minutes. And I certainly thank the gentleman. Madam Speaker, uh, Mr. Obama and the Democrats have constantly and consistently said we need to take a balanced approach to the debt crisis facing America. But they steadfastly refuse to even consider the one truly balanced approach to this problem, that being a balanced budget amendment to the United States Constitution. This effort today will be the second time that the House of Representatives will have passed legislation requiring a balanced budget amendment, which would actually create a permanent solution to this crisis and make sure that economic freedom can be available for Americans today and for future generations. Yet, Mr. Reed says he will kill this bill as soon as it comes to the Senate, or at least strip out the balanced budget amendment uh, in it. Uh, Madam Speaker, if, if we could get the President of the Senate, or uh, Mr. Reed here, and the President himself, uh, I, I guess we'd have to put out an a APB on the President, because we can't find him. He is AWOL in this debate, but if we could, I would ask them two questions. First, what is your plan to deal with this issue? Secondly, what on earth is so radical about having a balanced budget amendment to create a permanent solution to this problem? Now, I doubt we will get an answer, Madam Speaker, so today we will have to do as we have done before, and we will try to proceed without them and try to do something truly historic that will save this nation and its people from economic ruin. Madam Speaker, not long ago, right after the, the Constitution was finished, Thomas Jefferson said, I wish it were possible to obtain a single amendment to the Constitution. I would be willing to depend on that alone for the reduction of the administration of our government to the genuine, genuine principles of its Constitution. I mean an additional article taking from the federal government the power of borrowing." Close quote. Madam Speaker, Thomas Jefferson was right, and how I wish his contemporaries had listened to him about the balanced budget amendment, but they didn't. But now we have a crisis of $14 trillion facing us as a result of not having this amendment. And it could crush us in a way that no military power has ever done. And in this moment in history in America, we may get a second chance, and I hope my colleagues will join us in this historic effort. Gentlelady from New York. Madam Speaker, I'm delighted to yield a minute and a half to the gentleman from Massachusetts, ranking Democrat on financial services, Mr. Frank. Gentleman from Massachusetts, recognized for one and a half minutes. Madam Speaker, we have a sad spectacle today of a substantive mess brought to us by a procedural bigger mess. But I can't entirely blame Speaker Boehner. We have seen him all week forced to retreat continually from an effort to be conservative but somewhat responsible to a position where today we have a bill 
that no one thinks will solve the problem because it makes as a prerequisite to raising the debt a constitutional amendment that no one thinks will pass. I remember Speaker O'Neill when I got here, and, and there's one thing he and the Speaker Boehner seem to me to have in common, that's a theme song. Speaker O'Neill's theme song was, I'll be with you in apple blossom time. By now, Speaker Boehner is entitled to take as his theme song, it's my party and I'll cry if I want to, because his party has forced him to retreat, first of all, from the position he tried to take to get this thing done, and secondly, from a set of promises he made procedurally. As a result of where we are today, with martial law rules and amendments being sprung and amendments not being vetted, there is no procedural promise that the Republicans made that they have left unbroken. So we have a flawed bill brought to us by a weakened speaker under an unfortunate and undemocratic process. Once it's out of the way, once whatever impulses have driven members of his own party so to undercut him are satisfied, maybe then in an adult way we can sit down and work this out. Now I expect to vote for something I don't like because we have to compromise. But this bill doesn't even begin to meet any kind of serious test. Gentleman from California. Speaker, uh, I'll reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves. Gentlelady from New York. I'm pleased to yield a minute and a half to the gentlewoman from Maryland, Ms. Edwards. Gentlelady from Maryland is recognized for one and a half minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. You know, I'm shocked. I mean, we spent four hours on the floor of the House of Representatives in January debating a constitu the, uh, reading the Constitution, and now we get to spend a minute debating it. It's pretty amazing how much the folks on the other side value the Constitution of the United States. I'm opposed to the rule, the bill, uh, everything that's, that's connected with it. We approach this August 2nd deadline. The markets have closed down yet one more time before this weekend begins. And President Obama has been crystal clear. He said that any agreement to increase the debt ceiling has to extend to 2013. And yet here we are, considering something that the President has said is a non-starter, the Senate has said is a non-starter, the American people have said is a non-starter, and here we are again debating something that will never go anywhere. The Republican majority really should be embarrassed for the American people. I mean, they are putting everything in jeopardy and leaving nothing uh, up to the president to decide come August 2nd when this debt ceiling deadline approaches and, and placing at risk our retirement security, placing at risk our ability to get credit, our ability to, uh, to get a home mortgage, all of that because of this recklessness. The bill that Speaker Boehner brought to the floor yesterday in this constitutional amendment was hurriedly drafted today just to please the far right elements of the Tea Party. I can't even believe we're here today trying to satisfy the far right when we're not busy satisfying the needs of the American public and the markets around the world. Why are we voting on this plan and not one that we're, has a fighting chance of avoiding default? I want to say, Madam Speaker, it's time for America to get, get busy here, understanding that the Republican majority is ready to jeopardize our entire future Time's and put expired. at risk our entire future for this garbage, and I yield. Gentleman from California. I will continue to reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman continues to reserve. Gentlelady from New York. Madam Speaker, I'm pleased to yield one minute to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly. Gentleman from Virginia, recognized for one minute. Thank, I thank my friend. Madam Speaker, the bill proposed last night by the House Republicans set us up to fail and risk a catastrophic default. Today's gimmick is more of the same, but to win over the crowd calling for default, House Republican leadership would now make the disaster even more likely by including a constitutional amendment likely requiring a three-fifths vote to avoid any future default. As our Republican colleagues sadly demonstrated yesterday, that threshold will be impossible to meet today and in the future. Their blind adherence to the demands of the default caucus stands in sharp contrast to the desire of most Americans who, according to every poll, are demanding a balanced compromise. This bill is a blatant, cynical exercise in raw political muscle and nothing more. To the House Republicans bent on turning our founding fathers into deadbeat dads, I would respond using Speaker Boehner's own words from last year, hell no, you can't. And I yield back to the distinguished ranking member. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from California continues to reserve. The, the gentlelady from New York. 
Madam Speaker, I am pleased to yield two minutes to the gentleman from Maryland, the Ranking Democrat of the Budget Committee, Mr. Van Hollen. The gentleman from Maryland is recognized for two minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and I, I thank my colleague. Uh, there's a little pattern emerging here. Uh, first, we had our Republican colleagues walk out of the Biden talks. Uh, then twice they walked out of talks with the President. Uh, then they totally rejected a proposal put forward by the Republican leader in the Senate, Mitch McConnell. And last night they said no to the proposal put forward by their own speaker. And that brings us to where we are today. In order to accommodate the more extreme elements of the Republican caucus, they had to change the bill once again. And now what they're proposing is that ultimately we turn budget authority over not to the elected representatives, but to a federal judge who would ultimately decide how we're going to deal with our budget. You talk about passing the buck. You talk about not taking responsibility. Now is the time to come together to come up with a reasonable compromise, not to move the parties far apart. The last point, Madam Speaker, I want to make with regards to the deficit. We want to make sure we have a plan, a balanced plan, to reduce the deficit. And I'm just waiting for my colleagues to say, my colleagues on the other side to say, that they're willing to get one penny, one penny from eliminating taxpayer subsidies to the oil companies or closing corporate loopholes for jets, just one penny for the purposes of deficit reduction. Then we'll know that they're serious about that. The, the President has said, let's do $3 in spending cuts, $1 in revenue. But apparently, asking $1 of revenue by eliminating a subsidy for the oil companies, that's too far. Oh yes, we owe China. We need to do something about our debt to China. But asking the oil companies to take less taxpayer dollars, federal taxpayer subsidy dollars, no. We can't do that. Let's be serious about balancing the budget and getting the deficit under control, but let's do it in a balanced way. This proposal takes us farther in the wrong direction, doesn't bring us together to solve a problem for the American people. Now's the time to get serious. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Gentleman from California. Madam Speaker, this time I'm happy to yield two minutes to a very hardworking member of the Committee on Appropriations, my good friend from Houston, Texas, Mr. Culbertson. Gentleman from Texas is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I think it's very revealing in the debate today that the American people can see that the opposition to the proposal before the House is that we're attempting to even uh, suggest that there be a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution, not any specific amendment. We want, as a constitutional conservative majority, to see a vote in the House and the Senate on a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution, something I've co-authored since I got here in 2001, yet the minority is strenuously objecting to that. The minority objects to our effort to control the debt and the deficit without raising taxes. They ob object to strong spending caps in the future, which, by the way, exempt anyone over the age of 55 in, under Medicare, Medicaid. They're exempt under the Paul Ryan budget. They're exempt under the proposal that Speaker Boehner has brought to us today. The Speaker has attempted to find the largest possible cuts with the strongest possible enforceable budget caps that could pass a Democrat Senate in order to get it on the desk of the President before the August 3rd deadline. The, the Speaker and this new constitutional conservative majority are doing everything in our power to avoid a default while honoring the trust that the nation put in us in this landslide election which just occurred in November, the nation spoke decisively in electing this new majority to the House. We were sent here to control spending, to control the size of the government, to get the government out of our lives, out of our pockets, and back within the bounds of the Constitution as designed by the founders, and we've attempted to do that. And I applaud Speaker Boehner for working so diligently to find the largest possible cut that could possibly pass a liberal Democrat controlled temporary liberal Democrat controlled Senate in the very short span of time that we've got here. We'd all like to get more, but if you can get 60, 70 percent of where you need to go to get the nation back on track to a balanced budget and avoid the brick wall that lies ahead of us on August 3rd, we need to do so to avoid a default. And I applaud the Speaker for bringing this package to the floor and urge all the members to support it. Gentlelady from New York. Madam Speaker, I yield a minute and a half to the gentlelady from Texas, a member of the Judiciary Committee, Ms. Jackson Lee. 
gentlelady from Texas is recognized okay. for one and a half minutes. I thank the gentlelady uh, very much. Last night, the Democrats were here waiting while the Republicans could not get their own conference together. Any of you were watching the national news. It was not because we were not ready to vote and to move forward on a compromise. It was because those who believed they had a landslide victory are still talking about elections instead of talking about the American people. This is the worst bill that any American could ever imagine in the history of this nation. I tell you that because this bill will, in fact, default the American government in six months. And it will not adhere to the Constitution, which says the Declaration of Independence is the promise and the Constitution is the fulfillment. We actually have the authority, Mr. President, under the 14th Amendment to raise the debt ceiling by way of acknowledging that the public debt should always be recognized. But in this particular legislation, in six months, if we do not cut by $1.6 trillion and pass two of a balanced budget amendment, the nation will default. And the balanced budget amendment is not by majority. It is 60% of this Congress will stop the American people from receiving their just due. We will not have Social Security. We will not have Medicaid. We will not have Medicare. And actuality, the mandate will cause us to support the Republican study budget, which is $9 trillion in cuts, 70% of discretionary funding. That means all of your Medicare, all of your Medicaid, all of your Social Security. Mr. Speaker, Madam Speaker, I ask the American people to call in and say, stop the madness and compromise. Do what is right. And Mr. President, if not, raise the debt ceiling under the Constitution. You have the authority. Ladies, I time back. has expired, and members are reminded to direct their comments to the chair and the gentleman from California. Madam Speaker, at this time, I'm very pleased to yield one minute to one of our thoughtful, hardworking new members of this Congress, the gentleman from Manchester, New Hampshire, Mr. Ginta. The gentleman from New Hampshire is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for yielding. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, what I want to say to the American people is let's stop the spending. Let's not call the president or the Congress to say stop this madness, call this body and say stop the spending because we have a $14.3 trillion debt, we have a $1.6 trillion deficit. Most Americans know and appreciate that that is not sustainable. So we today, through the will of the House and the work over the course of this week and past several weeks, have a piece of legislation that is responsible in that it cuts spending caps future spending, requires a balanced budget amendment so the country can finally have a voice, have a voice in how people in this body spend taxpayer dollars. It's time for us to tell the American people the truth about how their money is being wasted. It is time to stop that spending. It is time to get responsible and serious, and we are here to do that, not just my freshman class, but this Congress is here to do that. And I ask my friends from the other side to join us in that fight, to protect taxpayers and vote for this bill. I yield back. Gentlelady from New York. I'm pleased to uh, yield a minute and a half to the gentlewoman from Ohio, Ms. Kaptur. Gentlelady from Ohio is recognized for one and a half minutes. I thank the ranking member, Ms. Slaughter, for her generosity and advise my colleagues, budgets will balance when people go back to work. I rise against this amendment, the rule, and the underlying bill as inartful dodges from necessity. When a patient is weak, do you pull out their intravenous feeding tubes or do you help them recover? Do you do everything possible to build their strength or do you keep shutting off their oxygen machine? America's economy is struggling to grow after the deep Bush recession triggered by his bailout of Wall Street abuse, two wars, and trillions in tax cuts to the super rich, who, by the way, didn't create any jobs with it. Revenues to our federal government have fallen over $400 billion a year due to unemployment. That's $4 trillion over a decade. So what does the majority do to the patient? They pull out the tubes, and they now shove them down the elevator chute. 
Never before has any political party chosen to hurt America when she was recovering by edging her toward default. Their dangerous behavior has already caused hundreds of billions of dollars of losses in the stock market, pension funds and annuities, Social Security and Medicare checks are threatened, and economic growth and jobs are stalled due to all this uncertainty in the markets. Madam Speaker, America needs a Congress and President that focus on economic recovery and job creation. Budgets will balance when people go back to work. To delude oneself the cause is otherwise is to take America down the proverbial black hole. Jobs are the answer, not more dodges, not pushing the patient down the shaft, and not proposing amendments that truly dodge the real question, which is full economic recovery for the people of this country. And I yield back my remaining time. Gentleman from California. Madam Speaker, may I inquire of my uh, good friend from Rochester how many speakers she has remaining? I believe I have two. Two. Well, then, in light of that, Madam Speaker, I'll reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman okay. reserves. The gentlelady from New York. I am pleased to yield a minute and a half to my colleague from New York, Ms. Maloney. Gentlelady from New York is recognized for a minute and a half. I thank the gentlelady for her leadership, and I rise in opposition to the Republican rule. We have all been getting numerous phone calls from our constituents who are rightly worried that the interest rates will be going up on their homes, on their cars, on their student loans, because they see that this Congress is in chaos. Already since last Friday, shareholders in U.S. markets have lost over $400 billion in value just due to the uncertainty and the lack of action. Our constituents' retirement funds have been taking a hit and will continue to until this issue is decided and we have less than four days. We must stop this Republican roulette and get to work on a plan that is realistic, that can pass both houses. This is a dangerous game, putting forward a partisan bill that each time it comes back is more partisan, appealing to a more narrow sliver of America. Madam Speaker, we need to revisit a clean vote on the debt ceiling, as we have done 78 times since 1960. And if we don't, the President should do his constitutional duty and raise the debt ceiling on his own under the authority of the 14th Amendment. The Republican leadership have walked out on President Obama, on Vice President Biden, on McConnell, and even their own leader, Boehner. And then they want us to revisit this in six months and put the uh, economy in uncertainty. Uh, this is the wrong direction. Gentlemen, ladies, time I urge expired. No vote. Gentleman from California. Uh, uh, I think the gentleman has one remaining speaker. Actually, I do. I have uh, one, two, three, I believe, three or four. Okay, then I'll, I'll reserve the balance. Right. Gentleman reserves. The gentleman lady from New York. Please uh, yield a minute to the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Rothman. Gentleman from New Jersey is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I oppose the Republican default bill because it will lead to drastic cuts to Medicare and Social Security. Also, I oppose the Republican default bill because it protects tax breaks and loopholes for those Americans who make millions and billions of dollars in income per year. I oppose the Republican default bill because it calls for another default summit, another default crisis in six months, thereby un undermining the certainty that American businesses, investors, and families need to create jobs and move our country forward. With only a short-term increase under the Republican default bill, the full faith and credit of the United States will once again be held hostage to the differences in Washington. The Republican short-term plan that creates uncertainty will result in billions of dollars in increased interest rates that will hurt every single American and will hurt our country. I urge my Republican colleagues to join with the Democrats, to join with President Obama in creating a balanced plan with shared sacrifice that solves our debt crisis and eliminates this 
cloud hanging over our economy. Gentleman from California. Madam Speaker, uh, at this time I'm happy to yield uh, a minute to the former mayor of one of the ten most livable cities in the United States of America, the gentleman from Rogers, Arkansas, Mr. Womack. Gentleman from Arkansas is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and I thank the gentleman for yielding some time. On my way over to the Capitol this afternoon, I was accompanied by uh, some young people from back in my district, Payson and McKenna from Mena, Arkansas, and Adam and Grace Ann from Fayetteville, Arkansas, and we were having a conversation about the debate that's going on right now in Washington, the debate about the debt ceiling. And as I explained to these young people that the uh, current debt of the United States of America, uh, their share of that current debt is well into the mid $40,000 range, $46,000 or so of debt. And it's for this very reason that we are proposing what we are proposing, because the only way to keep this debt on these innocent young people from soaring gr to greater and greater levels, to an area that they can no longer afford, is to restrain, constrain government. And the only sure way to do that, the only guaranteed enforcement mechanism that I know that can accomplish that very thing is a balanced budget amendment. So on behalf of these young people and on behalf of young people across America, let's quit piling more and more debt on our children and our grandchildren. Let's pass the rule. Let's pass this bill. And I yield back. Gentlelady from New York. Uh, Madam Speaker, I'm pleased to yield a minute to the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Scott. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized for one minute. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. In my one minute, I want to make a special appeal that we pay close attention to what I consider the most devastating, damaging part of this bill. And that is what we are doing and what the Republicans are doing to Social Security, to Medicare, and to Medicaid. In this bill, it requires that we set up a joint select committee. There are no protections in here. And it says in order for us to give the raise to the debt ceiling, we must concur and cut $1.6 trillion from the budget from discretionary funding. Now, the Center for Policy and Budget Priorities have said that since 80% of the discretionary areas come from Social Security, Medicaid, and Medicare, it doesn't take a genius to know that we're talking about drastic cuts in this area. And they will come out to a tune of about $1,000 for each recipient. Now, I don't know about you all, but we have some people in this country who are hanging on by their fingernails. We have widows, we have seniors, we have s youngsters who are dependent upon Social Security, dependent upon Medicare. And to say that in this measure, that we will make these drastic cuts in Social Security and Medicare is totally irresponsible. Time's and for expired. that reason, let us vote Gentleman's this measure expired. down. Gentleman from California. Madam Speaker, I'd like to continue to reserve. Continues to reserve. The gentlelady from New York. And Madam Speaker, I yield one minute to the gentleman from California, Mr. Pasta. Gentleman from California, recognized for one minute. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. This rule and the bill will further drive a wedge between the two parties rather than bringing this closer to an agreement, which we must have. It's been a week since the bipartisan discussions over the $4 trillion grand deal broke down, and we've seen little progress toward a solution since then. Missing in today's debate is a bipartisan approach toward our nation's fiscal house. We must have a bipartisan approach. We can cut through this partisan rhetoric with a balanced package. For me, that means implementing the Simpson Bowl recommendations, reducing spending by $4 trillion over the next 10 years, lowering tax rates, ensuring solvency of Medicare and Social Security, and stabilizing our debt. The House should consider a clean balanced budget amendment, H.J. Res. 2, which says the country can't spend more than it takes in. This amendment, Simpson Bowles' recommendations, must be coupled with a debt limit increase to get us through the next 18 months. It's time for cooler heads to prevail. With the clock ticking down, our nation's first effort default is at hand. We cannot afford to wait a minute longer. Default is not an option. I yield the balance of my time. Gentleman's time's expired, and the gentleman from California continues to reserve. The gentlelady from New York. Madam Speaker, I am pleased to yield two minutes 
to the gentleman from Massachusetts, Ranking Democrat on Energy and Environment Committee, Mr. Markey. The gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized for two minutes. I thank the gentlelady. The Republican Party deficit plan is very simple. Number one, send the financial markets into a nosedive. Number two, drive up costs for home mortgages, student loans, and credit cards. Number three, spook businesses to stall job growth, bringing the nation to the brink of economic collapse. Number four, repeat it all again and again until Election Day 2012. The Republicans don't want compromise. They want capitulation. The Republicans have brought to the floor a constitutional amendment to balance the budget. That's going nowhere. It is phony. But there's another sinister constitutional amendment being debated here. It's very real. And it will cause our country to default on its obligations. Amendment 14, Section 4 of the Constitution says, the validity of the public debt shall not be questioned. But this bill would change the Constitution forever. Forever. Under this Republican bill, our country would be pushed into defaulting on our obligations. The Republican Party would turn the 14th Amendment from a guarantee into a question mark. Now, under the Republican bill, the validity of the public debt shall be questioned. That is what they are doing this weekend. This is unacceptable and would have a disastrous effect upon our economy and the middle class. The only way to end this historic nightmare is to resolve another massive deficit, the leadership deficit in the Republican Party. We must vote down this constitutional amendment, which will have us not honoring the full faith and credit of the United States, which was built into the 14th Amendment of our United States Constitution. They are amending that Constitution here this evening. They are leading us to a default, which will be a violation of that Constitution. Gentleman from California. Gentleman continues to reserve the gentlelady from New York. Madam Speaker, I'm very pleased to yield one minute to the gentlewoman from California, Democrat leader, Ms. Pelosi. Minority leader from California is recognized for one minute. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I thank the gentlelady for yielding and commend her and her colleagues on the Rules Committee for their important work in bringing legislation to the floor. Uh, Madam Speaker, the clock is ticking. Now, the clock is ticking on the need for us to raise the debt ceiling so that we do not default on our past obligations, uh, that we uphold the full faith and credit of the United States of America. As we continue this debate today, one thing is very clear to me. If our goal were to find deficit reduction in a balanced bipartisan way, we could certainly do that, could certainly do that. We've had models, Simpson Bowles, we've had the Gang of Six, we've had the President's conversations with Speaker Boehner. We could find a path to very serious deficit reduction. But I think it has become very clear that that is not the goal of the Republicans in the House of Representatives. They keep moving the goalpost making it very evident that their goal is to reduce the public role in the lives of the American people. That's why in legis other legislation on the floor, like the Interior Bill that has been uh, debated today, you see, you see abandoning clean air standards, clean water, food safety. I've said before I come to this Congress as a mother and a grandmother and we all want to do the best for our children personally, but we need a public role, their education. Uh, again, clean air, clean water, food safety. We can't do that for ourselves. But part of this is to unravel, of the Republican plan is to unravel 50 years, five decades at least, of bipartisan progress on behalf of America's middle-class families. 
flat out, flat out, the, this bill and the other bills accompanying it will end Medicare, will end Medicare, will say to seniors, you will pay more for your health care costs to get less so that we can give tax breaks to, we can give tax subsidies to big oil. We will say to those families, we're going to cut Medicaid and what that means to seniors in nursing homes so we can give tax breaks to corporations sending jobs overseas. We will say to the young people, you're going to pay more for your college uh, loans so that we can give tax cuts to people at, at the highest end. We all know that we have to participate in reducing the deficit. Everybody has to ante up. Why is it that the Republicans insist on having the middle class pay the price so that the high end is off the hook? Uh, if we are concerned about the addressing the problems of the American people, we would end this debate. This bill is going nowhere. It is a total waste of time. And every day that we spend on these wastes of time that are not going anywhere is another day we are not talking about the highest priority of the American people, which is job creation. Job creation, job creation. That is their priority. We have an obligation, an obligation to reduce the deficit and get on with it so it can create jobs. If we're concerned about the Amer economic security of the American people and their families, we, rec we must recognize that since the Republicans' most recent walking away from the table, they've done it on more than one occasion, but last Friday when the Speaker and the Republicans walked away from the table, since that day, the stock market has dropped 483 points. Amer the American people have lost over $400 billion in their personal assets, $400 billion. And every day that goes by, and if the market goes down anymore, it comes right out of what the American people have, have in their uh, uh, 401ks and their pensions and other pensions, their savings for their children's education and that. And so, uh, you know, I remember when we had the debate on TARP, it was President, uh, we cooperated with President Bush at that time to bring legislation to the floor. Very unpopular, probably the most unpopular vote any of us will have to take, but we were on the brink of a financial crisis, and we had to act. But the Republicans did not step up to the plate, and the market went down over, well, 777 points the next day. Is that what they're waiting for, for the market to go down, not 485 points in the last few days, but hundreds of points more, diminishing the personal assets and wealth of the American people? I certainly hope not. You know, uh, when the Speaker uh, walked away and he made his statement, uh, Speaker Boehner, our Speaker, said, uh, we couldn't reach agreement, words to that effect, we couldn't connect because we have different visions of America. Uh, well, I believe the speaker when he speaks, but I don't believe they have different visions of America. President Obama's vision of America is one where we, commit, we are committed to the education of our children so they can reach their personal fulfillment in our country through innovation continue to be number one. That we are committed to creating jobs, good paying jobs for America's workers. I think that vision is a vision of the American people, the high ground of where we share values, the education of our children, jobs for our workers, the dignified retirement and health security for our seniors, and uh, a personal safety and national security for our people, all done in a fiscally sound way. I think that that's common ground on the high ground of values. With, and if you believe that, if you agree with those values, as I think uh, Speaker Boehner must agree with President Obama on that vision of America, you couldn't possibly vote for any of the legislation that the Republicans are bringing to the floor uh, um, in, the, in these few days. You couldn't possibly, because they do they do undermine the education of our children, the financial and health security of our seniors, uh, the uh, deep cuts early on uh, curtail, hurt uh, the economic recovery and the creation of jobs. And it isn't in a fiscally sound way we've taken 
revenue off the table. 57% of the American people at least think we should have a balanced bipartisan agreement uh, to end this default and to do so in a way that doesn't take us down this path again. So let us, you know, let's be uh, clear. This, what is on the floor today, balanced budget. Balanced in what way? Balanced in whose favor? It looks like a seesaw to me in favor of the haves at the expense of the great middle class in our country. It must be rejected. For every day that we waste on another a Republican ideological ploy or scheme is another day that we are not creating jobs. Since the Republicans took office, which is over 200 days ago, last, Friday, last Saturday it was 200 days, going on 207, the only bills that they have brought to the floor which they claim to be jobs bills are not job creators, they are job losers. Job losers. H.R. 1 loses about 700,000 jobs. H.R. 2, a similar number. H.R. 34, a similar number. Nearly 2 million jobs lost. Almost 10,000 jobs a day. They're losing. And their, um, uh, their infrastructure bill that they have brought into committee, not voted on it yet, thank God, it lo will lose, is estimated to lose another several hundred thousand jobs when it's supposed to be the big job creator. Even the, even, uh, the Chamber of Commerce has rejected it as something that will not only lose jobs, uh, not create jobs, but will lose current jobs. So let's get on with the business of job creation. Let's really be honest about what we're here to do in terms of deficit reduction, not use it as an engine for the destruction of the public role that is so important in the defense of our country, in the health of our children, in the uh, security of our seniors in their retirement, about the, uh, the vitality and innovation uh, of our uh, economy, and again, to do it in a way uh, that is fiscally sound. I don't want to go into how we got here in the first place. Whatever it is, we have to go forward, and we must go forward the way the American people want us to do. Bipartisan, balanced, and with an eye to job creation. Reject what is on the floor now and support the American people. We owe it to honor the, honor the sacrifice of our founders, the vision of our founders, the sacrifice of our men and women in uniform, the aspiration of our children and our families. Uh, this a budget should be a statement of values that honors all of that. And if we are to honor that, we must reject what is being proposed here today. With that, I yield back the balance of my time.